this conference is about the future, and there is really nothing that determines our future as much as basic research. And the unique thing and the, the remarkable thing about basic research is that you know where you are, you know what you're looking for right now, but you never know where it will lead you to. And uh, what we try to do in this session, what we try to do in this session is to give you some glimpse of the most remarkable frontiers that we are, that, that we are trying to reach today, uh, that science is trying to reach today. And it will be only a glimpse, but I hope that it will be an impressive one. Uh, just to give you a, an idea that everybody knows that um, the Wi-Fi, the worldwide internet, was invented by a scientist in CERN, by particle physicist. What is less known, and actually learned myself, learned it only just yesterday from one of my colleagues here, is the Wi-Fi and wireless, which we all use now. Some of you may be using your laptops using this wireless connection was invented by astronomers in Australia because they needed to, to transfer large files of data from one to another. So this is just a glimpse of an idea that we know where we start, we don't know where we'll end with the science, and I hope that you will enjoy listening to some of the beginnings. And I'll begin with, uh, we'll begin with uh, Professor Jeff Hoffman. Uh, Jeff is a professor at MIT. He's a former astronaut with uh, five trips to space. It's not the world record, but it's very close. And uh, <clears throat> he was on the crew that prepared the Hubble, space, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope. So we all admire the beautiful Hubble pictures. Without this repair mission, we wouldn't have them. So we all have to thank him for that. And I also discovered something remarkable that Jeff brought to us. This is a mezuzah, and we, you all know what's a mezuzah, but this mezuzah is unique because this mezuzah was on the discovery um, shuttle turn, turning around the earth for about 10 days. And Jeff brought it back to here, brought it to Jerusalem, and it was the idea of the late Teddy Kolek to put it in the Museum of Science. And since the director of the museum is my ex-student, I forced him to take it off the wall just for this <laughs> session. So you have a chance to see it here today or go to the museum. It's a really beautiful piece of art, but it's also something from outer space. So, so Jeff, please come and Jeff will be our first speaker. Okay, well, thanks. So I was asked to talk about a uh, fairly wide range of subjects from the, the future. I'll raise it up. How's that? Can you hear me in back? Good. Uh, so the future of uh, space exploration, a little bit about astronomy, uh, the relationship of humans and robots, that's a pretty big uh, chunk in just uh, a few minutes, but uh, let's start. First of all, uh, just to report that not only today is the Hubble Space Telescope well and good, but we fully expect it will be working tomorrow, which is what this is about, and the day after tomorrow, and for quite some time to come. Um, I did have the great privilege of being on the crew that rescued the Hubble telescope after those of you who are old enough and remember that when it was put into space, it did not focus properly. We put in the corrective optics. Some people refer to it as contact lenses. Actually, we did it all with mirrors, but the result was truly spectacular, and Hubble has gone on to revolutionary, or revolutionize our understanding of the universe. We've seen these spectacular pictures of the birth of stars, of the death of stars. I mean, these, these patterns here are not the work of some psychedelic artists. That's nature, that's the universe. Uh, and, and these things uh, are all around us and Hubble has made these images uh, available to people throughout the world. It's also given us the ability to look back in time. 
because with its sensitivity, we can see galaxies uh, billions of light years away, and that means that the light that is reaching us today left those galaxies when the universe was a much younger place. Um, this is the famous Hubble deep field picture made by pointing Hubble just in one small part of space, about what you would see through your fingers, and just let it record to see what was there. This was a part of space that for all other telescopes was basically empty. You can look a few of these pictures, you can see those little crosshairs, those are actually stars. Everything else you see in this picture is a galaxy, thousands of them. It's, uh, it's extraordinary. And in looking back, uh, we have seen that some of the early galaxies are much less well formed than we see now. So we've actually been able to see back to the time in the universe when galaxies were being born. Hubble is not powerful enough to see the birth of the very first stars. That's something for tomorrow's astronomy and the Webb Space Telescope, which despite its difficulties, hopefully will be launched in another four or five years. This is much larger, even more sensitive than Hubble. Um, it, what, what we are doing in space astronomy is to take the state of the art of about 20 years ago and then move it up into space. Hubble is basically using the technology of the Palomar Telescope. Astronomers went on to develop the multi-mirror telescopes and that's what Webb is uh, ultimately going to be. Just to give you some idea of the scale, this is a full-size model of the Webb telescope. Each of those sun shields that you see are the size of a tennis court. So this whole thing has to be folded up, the mirrors as well, in order to fit inside a rocket. And then we're going to put it a million miles the other side of the moon, and hopefully the whole thing is going to open up uh, properly. If not, maybe we'll go and fix it. I hope we don't have to do that. Uh, telescopes allow us to explore the universe passively. We just see the radiation that comes to us. But through our development of robotic probes, such as the uh, spectacular spirit and opportunity probes that have been working on Mars for the last eight or so years, we can actually interact not on a personal basis, but at least robotically with uh, extraterrestrial environments. This is a view from orbit, uh, but the probes itself, I mean, it's hard to believe. This is Mars, this is another planet, and yet we get these spectacular images. And our probes, when I think of what the universe was to me when I was a schoolboy, I mean, Saturn had three rings, nine satellites, which were just points of light. Now we look at it, hundreds of rings. And each of these satellites of Saturn, Jupiter, Uranus, Neptune, have been resolved into individual planets. The, the, the solar system is a far richer place than it was when I was young. And this satellite, Enceladus, uh, we're finding there's water all over the solar system. Where we find liquid water, any place on the Earth we find liquid water, we find life. And so there is this question, are there other places in our solar system where life might exist? Enceladus, a satellite of Saturn, this is a, these are volcanoes made of water. There's liquid water there, there's liquid water on Europa, on Jupiter. This is an artist's conception of what things might look like if you were on the surface of Enceladus, looking back at Saturn through one of these water eruptions. As I say, the, the solar system as well as the universe are far more fascinating places now uh, than they were a generation ago. And we've sent probes, this is the, uh, the Voyager probe, which now has actually, it's in the process of leaving the solar system. It's, it's the first man-made object that is actually flying into interstellar space, and it's still talking to us. So there's tremendous excitement that, that's been going on in both telescopic exploration passively and in our robotic exploration of space. 
Um, maybe the most exciting thing that's going on, I think, is the search for other planets. This is a dream that astronomers have had for decades. Uh, are there planets around other stars? And if so, how common are they? The Kepler satellite, of course, the first exosolar planet was discovered in 1995, telescopes on the Earth, but we now have the Kepler satellite, which has found thousands of planetary candidates just in the stars near the Earth. And most importantly, we've now started to find planets that are in the so-called habitable zone. This is in our solar system. Uh, the Earth, of course, is in the habitable zone. This is the range where it's not too hot or too cold, but water can exist as a liquid. And we've now started to find planets around other stars. And amazingly, we have found that there are more plant just by doing the statistics of the stars near us, we now know that there are more planets even than there are stars, which means just in our galaxy there are hundreds of billions of planets, and some of them are in the habitable zone with liquid water, so the probability that there is life out there, I think, is uh, extremely strong, and the search for life for planets with atmospheres with which and, and amazingly, we are now just at the point where we're, we're getting able to measure the chemical composition of the atmospheres of planets around other stars. And if we find free oxygen or ozone, this will be an indication of life. So a lot of excitement in store. Uh, even this uh, planet looks like out of Star Wars. Remember Tatooine with the, uh, the double star? There really is a planet that's going around a double star, very much unexpected. Uh, I want to go now to the future of human spaceflight, uh, which is what I uh, have devoted a large part of my life to. Uh, and we've come a long way since the original space race, which was part of the original Cold War. 1961, the flight of Yuri Gagarin, John Glenn. We won, the cold, uh, we won the space race, we got to the moon. That still is the only body other than the Earth that humans have ever gone to. And then, amazingly, we stopped. But uh, the biggest change, and I think this is what the future holds, is that human spaceflight has become very much international. This is the International Space Station, uh, over 20 countries involved in it, the largest scientific undertaking ever uh, put together uh, in human history. Now, of course, the Chinese are the newest uh, entrance to the uh, human space flight. There's Chinese astronauts in orbit uh, at a Chinese space station. You may not appreciate how many countries have actually had people going into space. Um, this gives uh, some idea, well, it's not coming through too clearly. Uh, up there, but you can see it's still the, the U.S. is dominant with Russia sort of in second place. But the, uh, the other thing I, I do have to mention here, uh, you know, in this context, we have had many international astronauts flying both with the Russians and uh, with us at NASA. Uh, they share both the glory and the tragedy, and this is a tribute to Ilan Ramon, who I did get to know while he was at NASA and tragically was lost with the Columbia. He shared the wonder of being in space and then paid the ultimate price coming back. This is something we won't be seeing anymore. The shuttle has been retired. Um, and in the United States, uh, I think the biggest new development, and it's a future which I don't know how it's going to evolve, but there is a generation of billionaires who grew up in the post-Apollo era, and they are space nuts, and they are investing billions of dollars, private money, into the development of private spaceflight. It started with the X Prize uh, in the last decade. Paul Allen, Microsoft, um, developed Spaceship One. They won the X Prize. Uh, Spaceship One is now hanging in the Smithsonian in a place of honor next to the Spirit of St. Louis and the Bell X-1, which Chuck Yeager used to break the sound barrier. You may recognize the guy on the right, Richard Branson. He figured there's money to be made, so he formed Virgin Galactic. Uh, they're going to take people into space 
on a short flight, you'll only get about six or seven minutes of weightlessness, and you'll have to pay $200,000, but he already has about 500 people who have signed up, and it's for real. This is Spaceship Two and its trial run, and if you look down here, whoop, this is the uh, Spaceport USA, which is uh, almost finished now, being built outside of Las Cruces, New Mexico. There are numerous commercial spaceports being built all over the United States. Uh, Jeff Bezos, Amazon.com. We have half a dozen companies developing this private space flight. And the fascinating thing is this is leading to a lot more innovation than we would have, have gotten. Bob Bigelow uh, made his fortune in budget motels. He's got a 50% scale model of an inflatable space station already in orbit. And as soon as one of these companies can take people up there, he's going to launch the whole thing. This is kind of a symbolic picture. It's the model of the old space shuttle and Elon Musk's Falcon 9 launching the Dragon capsule up to the International Space Station. So this is possibly the future, hard to say. Uh, just finishing up, I wanted to say one or two words about robotics in space. Um, we use robotics extensively, both on the shuttle and the International Space Station. We could not have fixed the Hubble Space Telescope without the use of the robotic arm. Um, we've put Robonaut, an anthropomorphic robot, up on the International Space Station. We have these incredible robots that I was talking about already that have been to Mars. The problem is they, they move so slowly. What Spirit and Opportunity have done in seven or eight years, an astronaut could basically do in a long weekend. Getting robots which can operate together with human beings is a huge challenge for future space activities as well as human robotic interactions here on Earth. I don't know how it's going to finally work out, but I do hope that we figure out how to do it. We have this dream someday that humans will once again leave the planet Earth to the moon, eventually to Mars. Uh, it is a new world out there, and I'll just finish. This is the last slide. You all see the sun up there. I don't know if you recognize how unique this view is of the sun. Every time in your life that you have seen the sun, you've seen it in a blue sky because we're here underneath the atmosphere. Here you see the sun the way it truly exists in space. It's a star. It's the nearest star. It's the brightest star but it's a star in the blackness of space. And this is a perspective which I hope that many more people will be able to have in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, about, uh, about eight years ago, almost eight years ago, uh, Albert Einstein and two young uh, collaborators, Podolsky and Rosen, Rosen actually went on to become the first professor of theoretical physics here at the Technion and was one of the founders of physics in Israel. But these guys in the 30s uh, started with some uh, very basic concept with the basic issues of quantum mechanics. And this basic concept that turned now almost eight years later, to a huge field of research. And uh, you'll, see, you'll wonder why there is such a great interest in such field of research. But it turns out that this basic fundamental question about the nature of uh, quantum physics opens us for us the gate for the dream of some of us, which is related to space flight. You all know from Star Wars, be me up, Scotty. So uh, this idea of teleportation is, sorry, Star Trek, not Star Wars. Uh, sorry. Um, and one of the founders of this new and exciting field of research is here with us today, Professor Anton Zellinger from the University of Vienna and from the uh, Austrian Academy of Science. Uh, apart from establishing this field, Anton 
uh, after establishing the field and in addition to it, Hunter received numerous prizes, including the Wolf Prize and also the Isaac Newton Prize. And I will not take too much of our time because if I want to count all the prizes, it will be just too long. So uh, let's hear from him what he is doing, not for me. Please. Okay, so, so uh, thank you very much, Zvi, for inviting me to come here. It's always a great joy to be in this country. So, what you see here on the first picture is a telescope, and uh, it nicely connects to the other speakers, uh, because we use this kind of telescope to, for quantum communication on the Canary Islands. And we are on the Canary Islands not for the reasons you think we are there. You know, it's not for the wine or the food, but on the Canary Islands you have what is called the European Northern Observatory. These are clusters of uh, telescopes built by various European uh, uh, countries and collaborations for the observation of the sun and of the night sky, as, you, as the, the logo indicates to the upper upper left of this picture here. Uh, the title I chose was Qu uh, Quantum Information from Burlesque Ideas to a New Information Technology. And before I go into more details, I want to mention two things. Firstly, quantum physics was de developed in the beginning of the 20th century, uh, initially to explain uh, behavior of individual particles, of, of atoms and so on. And it turned out to be one of the most important ingredients in modern technology. If you look at your, your, your mobile phone, it contains a computer which contains semiconductors which you cannot understand without quantum mechanics. The laser cannot be understood without quantum mechanics and so on. So why do I talk here about the new information technology? The point is that the uh, old information technology, if I might call it that way, is based on the behavior of many particles like many photons, many particles of light, many electrons, and so on. This statistics is very well understood. What we have now is we have now new ideas where we base our concepts on the behavior of individual particles. This is something was, which was considered to be completely un impractical even until the 1960s, but due to technological progress we can do these kind of things now. And the field was started because people wanted to see whether the predictions of quantum physics for individual particles are really as strange or as burlesque uh, as the forefathers told us, including Einstein, and then to the surprise of everybody, a new field of information technology arose. Here is one of these uh, Gedanken experiments invented by Erwin Schrödinger in the same year as the uh, paper mentioned by our chairman, by Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen was, Rosen was, was published. It's the famous uh, Schrödinger cat, which brings home uh, some of the fundamental issues and questions. Uh, just to explain it very briefly, you have a, a cat which is enclosed in a container together with some, uh, some, some uh, glass uh, vessel uh, which uh, carries cyanic acid. And the whole thing is divided, uh, 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 connected to a hell machine, to hell engine, as Schrödinger calls it. Uh, it's a radioactive atom, and if the radioactive atom decays, a hammer is released and breaks the container. So, this is all not very kind to the cat, but now let's talk about quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics tells us that after some time, they, we cannot say that the atom is decayed or not decayed. Actually, the quantum state of the atom is a superposition of decayed and not de decayed. It's both at the same time in some sense. Now, Schrödinger says, if quantum mechanics is universally valid, the cat should also be in a superposition of dead and alive at some time. So if, since we do not see superpositions of dead and alive cats, uh, there is a problem here. There is a fundamental problem, there is a conceptual problem, something might be wrong. You might say this is just a strange way how physicists talk about things, but it turns out that this idea to, to, to uh, show, uh, investigate uh, quantum phenomena for objects of increasingly larger size is one of the most vigorous 
research programs worldwide right now. More and more groups are entering this. And there are actually ideas which make it not completely unreasonable to think about superpositions of living systems someday. It's, to my opinion, it is more or less just a question of clever ideas, young good students, and enough money. Here is the notion of entanglement uh, introduced by, by Einstein in the paper mentioned. Uh, it is if, if, we, if we would have quantum dice, just consider, consider a pair of dice, if they would behave according to the laws of quantum mechanics, then when you throw the two dice, they always show the same number. And it is completely unpredict un unpredictable which number they show. And it turns out that if, uh, uh, if you throw them at large distances, no matter how far apart, they will still show the same number. So there can be two possible explanations. One is that there is some secret mechanism in there which makes them behave the same way. Or secondly, there is maybe some communication between them which also makes them to show the same results. We can exclude both explanations. So we have two random processes which always give the same result no matter how far they are away. This was called by, by Erwin Schrödinger the basic mystery of quantum mechanics. Uh, why do we say that the individual dice are completely random? This is one of the basic findings of quantum physics. To me, it's one of the deepest findings of science in the 20th century, that there are processes which are so random that there is no cause there's no way to give a causal explanation why the process happens that way. This is, for example, for the ca uh, case of the dye. It is in specifically in the laboratory, we have this for the decay of radioactive atoms. We cannot say at which time uh, an atom decays, and not only we cannot say it, I try to challenge my uh, theologically inclined friends, saying them that not even God knows when the atom will decay. <laughs> Some don't like this, but that's a separate question. Uh, so we have objective randomness. Uh, Einstein didn't like that. He said he's convinced that God does not play dice with the universe, to which uh, supposedly Bohr gave him the answer, stop telling the Lord how to run the world. Now, we have these two notions of entanglement and, and, uh, uh, and, and randomness, and one of the explanations is quantum teleportation, already mentioned here. It's the basic drawing of a recent experiment which we just finished, uh, just uh, a few weeks ago, between the two Canary Islands mentioned. I don't want to go into the technical details. People can look it up on the web. The basic point is that you can teleport the quantum state of a photon over a distance, in that case, 140 kilometers. Now, I have to disappoint you. This is not a future way of transportation, but it is a future way of communication between future quantum computers. It's the best way how future quantum computers would talk to each other. Actually, do you know why they invented uh, in these Star Trek movies uh, teleportation? It's basically to save money. To make, the, you know, if, if you would have to film the landing of a planet and the stars from a planet, it costs a lot because every planet looks differently. So, but if you beam the big guys up and down, it's much cheaper. And they knew that uh, there are problems with it. Uh, they, their basic idea was that you uh, scan the information of a system and send the information to the receiving station and reconstitute the object. Now, according to quantum mechanics, this cannot be done because Heisenberg says that you cannot determine the quantum state of a system completely. So to fix that, these guys invented, you Star Trek uh, fans know this, invented the Heisenberg compensator. And at one a press conference, one of the guys was asked, how does the Heisenberg compensator work? And his answer was, very well, thank you. <laughs> now, what we have learned in quantum mechanics is that you can transfer the information from A to B without A, this information taking any well-defined path. It just disappears here and shows up there. And secondly, you only can do it if you and nobody knows what this information is. That way we circumvent all these kind of limits. Now this, this, uh, this, this kind of experiment proves that in the future we will be able to go to space. Now I mentioned uh, quantum information. We talk about the field of quantum information processing and commun communication, which as, uh, Philip, uh, 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 as Bill Phillips, Nobel laureate in 1997 says, is more fundamentally different 
from current technology than the digital computers from the abacus. Why does he say that? Because in the digital computer, as well in the abacus, rep, uh, information is represented as real features of real objects. In the quantum computer, we don't have that anymore. We have superposition, we have entanglement, the information is, uh, is non-local, and so on and so on. What the field promises is computers of unprecedented speed, because they operate in a new complexity class, as we say. We, they can solve problems which are simply too complex for any conceivable classical computer, and they promise communication security which is guaranteed by the laws of nature. They operate with individual particles, with individual photons, with individual atoms, and so on and so on. The future is in space. This connects to the talk right now. Uh, the idea is to establish worldwide com a quantum communication using, for example, the International Space Station or or other, other, other uh, satellites. We have a program com uh, communicate, uh, uh, collaborating with the Chinese Academy of Sciences uh, to put a quantum satellite into space within the next five years. And it actually is amazing, and this is something where one can learn something from, it's actually amazing how fast China is able to make decisions. It's impressive. Europe is far away from that. So just uh, to mention one possible new application in, uh, of quantum information. It's called blind quantum computing. It's a very recent uh, uh, concept. Uh, the question is the following. You all know what cloud computing is. You have a central server, and uh, you use the central server to use to solve some problems. Now, in the end, you want to make sure as a client that the central server has no idea whatsoever what you are doing there. Not only the data, but also the kind of program you are using should be completely, completely uh, hidden to the, to the central server. And it is only that quantum computing can solve this kind of problem. Uh, I don't want to go into the details now, but this to me is probably one of the most important uh, ideas in the field, which I feel, uh, I'm actually convinced that someday we will have quantum computers and all this, because there's no basic obstacle against this kind of thing. Uh, but it may be that the most important consequence are conceptual consequences. More and more points to the, to the view that uh, uh, information is basically, in a sense, the most fundamental concept in the universe. It's not meta, it's not reality, it's information. And uh, it's something like the irreducible kernel from which everything else flows. This is an open uh, program which has not been finished yet, but in the end it might mean that we humans as observers play a more important role than we usually uh, see it. If you want to read, uh, for example, this article, you can look it up on my website. I want to end with the basic point that whatever happens is unpredictable. We have learned many times in basic, in basic science or in, in research that the really fundamental issues have not been, have not been seen even by the inventors. The famous quote, Michael Faraday was once asked by Sir Gladstone, he was the, they called him Chancellor of the Exchequer, the Finance Minister of Her Majesty. He asked Faraday, uh, this is all very nice, but what is it good for? And Faraday said, one day, sir, you may tax it. That's the best answer you can give a finance minister. Uh, what exactly will be done, Faraday didn't know, but he had a feeling that this is very important. Likewise, the guy who invented the radio waves, Heinrich Hertz, uh, he wrote, he asked for money to the Prussian Academy of Sciences, and he got the money even as, and this is now a literal quote from the, from the referee reports, even as this will never lead to a practical application. So the basic point is the really big breakthroughs are found in ways and by people who themselves don't even have an idea what happens. So. I'm sure we will have quantum computation someday. I'm also sure that this will revolutionize. But what? I don't know. Thank you very much. I just want to make one remark, which will make me worried when I saw the transparency it's the slides. Um, there is a big debate now in Israel about transporting monkeys for medical research out of Israel. 
I want to, that none of you will get out of this room with the idea that physicists kill cats. This is what we call a Gedanken experiment. We think about it, we don't even dream of doing it. Well, uh, we've all seen uh, the use of a telescope here. It was a remarkable use of a telescope to transport photons for uh, 140 kilometers and control two photons uh, that they'll be the same in, uh, they'll have, be, they have behaved in the same way even so they're 140 kilometers apart. But this is not the standard use of telescopes. Usually we use telescopes for different things. And our next speaker is uh, Bruno Leibergund from the European Southern Observatory. This was at the Euro European Northern Observatory. But Bruno is the scientific director of the European Southern Observatory, which is a conglomeration of uh, 15 countries who joined together for doing research in astronomy, building the largest telescopes now in South, um, together in South America. And by the way, Israel is now beginning the phase of trying to think about maybe we should join them, and I think it's a great idea if we'll manage to do it. Now, Bruno has been the managing the, the, the director there for uh, quite a few years. He's been in ESO for uh, about 20 years after being before that at Harvard and at uh, Berkeley. And uh, he has won as a part of the team the, in, 19, in 2007, the Gruber Prize for Cosmology for basically research uh, which is comparable and, and uh, to the uh, research that uh, won the Nobel Prize this year on the uh, unusual, ex unexpected expansion of the universe. So I invite Bruno to talk now about uh, astronomy and what the future of astronomy holds for us. So thank you, Tzvi, very much. This is a very nice introduction. It's almost too much. Uh, I have this task that I have to get you back down to the ground. Um, Jeff talked about uh, space and what the wonderful things we can do in space. Uh, we just heard about the wonderful uses of telescopes where you use one telescope to send a signal to another telescope. Um, what I'm going to talk about is really just telescopes to receive information from space. And where is it? Oh, here it is. So uh, what, what you see on this first slide already is how telescopes are changing. Um, you look at the upper right, that's a telescope that you think you recognize. It has a round dome, it has some structure in it, it has a mirror in it, as you will see. Uh, you see at the bottom, you don't see at the bottom, unfortunately, there is a set of antennas. Uh, that's another type of telescope. It's a radio telescope that uh, we would use and people use already. And then on the left side, that is a radio telescope as well. So there, uh, we move away from dishes. We move into what's called phased arrays. So we use different physics to actually build up new telescopes and new ways to observe the universe. So these are pictures all taken from the ground. So these are not HST pictures, but they're comparable to HST pictures or to the Hubble Space Telescope pictures. Um, Admittedly, most of these objects are bigger, so we, we don't need as much resolution as the Hubble Space Telescope provides, but they are comparable. And this is one of the reasons we do astronomy. It's uh, to understand the past of the universe, and by understanding the past of the universe, to be able to look into the future what this universe will be. But it's also the beauty of what the universe has to offer to us, the many different uh, objects being stars being formed, or stars that die in explosions and things like that. One thing that we need to understand is that when we observe the sky, we are looking through windows. Okay? Our atmosphere has a very important function. It's actually protecting us from radiation from, from uh, our sky, solar radiation in terms of UV radiation and things like that. So um, you see here a graph that shows you how the atmosphere, how the photons come through the atmosphere. This is electromagnetic radiation. And you see that there are these windows. Let me see. 
Well, I can't do this. Over on the left side, you see the radio telescopes. That's the radio place. Uh, that's the reason you actually can listen to uh, your radio in your car, because as Hertz discovered, the electromagnetic waves can travel in the atmosphere. Whereas if you go into the X-ray range, you will not see the sky. If you would build a de an X-ray telescope on the ground, you would not see the sky, because the atmosphere is shielding all the, all the light that's coming in that uh, wavelength range at that energy. And so you see the combination from ground-based astronomy, where you can do things from the ground, in the radio and in the optical, and things where you have to go into space. If you want to do X-ray astronomy, you have to do this from above the atmosphere. That's why we need satellites to do this. Um, the, there is an interesting moment in history right now, in astronomical history, if you want, which is that um, we now, right now at this moment, we can essentially observe the whole electromagnetic spectrum that the sky has to offer to us. This will disappear in a few years when uh, the X-ray satellites that are currently flying are going to run out of fuel. Uh, we have some of the millimeter uh, uh, telescopes, satellites, they will run out of fuel pretty soon, and so we can't observe those. Now, what's happening right now is, is sort of a revolution that will come in the next few years, which is we will observe the sky with particles that are not photons, not electromagnetic radiation, but there will be other messengers that will tell us about the sky. And these messengers are particles like neutrinos. Uh, we measure the neutrino flux from the sun. That has been done for many decades. There is one other astrono astronomical object that has ever been seen in neutrinos, which is a supernova explosion 180,000 light years away. And uh, we will be able in the future to see gravitational waves and also to directly detect dark matter. These are all physical problems that we need to target to understand the universe a bit better. You need different telescopes for these. The neutrino telescopes are all on the ground. They're not above ground, they're on the ground, and they actually would like to see the neutrinos as they come up from the Earth, if you want, from the other side of the Earth, because the neutrinos interact very little. Um, Jeffrey mentioned this. Uh, the universe, we've learned in the last uh, two decades that the universe is made up of much more than what we know. You've seen, Jeffrey Hoffman showed you this picture of the Hubble Deep Field with all these galaxies in there. What we see in there is 4% of what the universe is made of. Okay? This is this little wedge, it says here 5%, 45% is what we know, is what, what, what we call baryonic uh, matter. And the rest, the, the remaining 95%, is made up of things that we have observed indirectly. We know about them, but we don't know what they are. The physicists are trying to understand what this is. This is all coming out of astronomy right now, and this is one of the topics that we need to solve in the next 15 to 20 years. Here's another example of something that uh, Jeffrey already mentioned. This is the planets around other stars. He showed you many pictures about the planets around the sun in our solar system. But what you see here, this is one example. The, the top figure is one example. This tiny little dot that you see next to the black dot in the center, the black uh, center here is the, the light from the star is blocked out. Okay? There's a little device that just blocks the, the, the light from the star. And you see towards 10, 11 o'clock, there's a little white dot that is a planet that's orbiting this star. The, the amazing thing is this planet is orbiting this star within this, what, what looks like flames, is a large dust, disk of dust that's orbiting that star as well, okay? So this is a planet within the, a disk, which is a completely different environment from what we know in our solar system. So this is another example of, of how we're gonna explore the new worlds the, it, with these planets, these exoplanets. Uh, Jeffrey already mentioned there is now uh, billions of planets. We think we know billions of planets. Now, what he didn't tell you is we know about these planets, but we actually can't take direct images of them. This is one of the three examples that we know, okay? Everything else, we know about the planets that they're there, but we can't actually directly see them. And so one of the things in the future that we need to do is we need to build telescopes that we can investigate these planets and possibly 
find life on them or find signatures of life uh, on them. Um, so here's an example. This is, this is unfortunately not working. Let me see if that works. No, so unfortunately, this was supposed to be two uh, small movies. Uh, what you see here is the very center of our own Milky Way. And what you see is these dots here are all stars. Now, if, you, if I could show you the movie, you would see that these stars are actually moving on the sky. We now are able to observe how these stars move. It takes, 20, uh, it takes uh, about 20 years to observe those things. So you have to come back every year and take another image. So your film camera is a very, very slow film camera. It's a, it's a telescope in this case. And if you, if you then take this long enough, you see that these points are actually orbiting. They're going around a dark spot where there is nothing. And that dark spot where there is nothing is the black hole that holds this galaxy together. Okay, so at the center of our own Milky Way, there's a black hole that's extremely massive, four, ti four million times the mass of our own sun, okay? On, squeezed together on a tiny little thing, and that's what's, uh, what you can see there. What we can do in the next, with the next generation of telescopes is we can actually measure whether Albert Einstein was right, okay? We can measure whether his uh, theory of general relativity is the correct one for very strong uh, gravitational fields. So this, this is another movie that doesn't work either. This actually has, uh, well, it's very hard to see. There, there was a, a counter at the bottom, and it actually counts up to 2043. So I could have shown you the future for the, for the thing. What this movie would show you is a gas cloud that was discovered last year that's actually falling into the black hole. That's gis that will give us a chance to observe how a black hole eats up material. So that will be a first. Uh, by the way, here's, here's the observatory on the upper right that uh, Anton Seiling has been using. That's the observatory that was sending the signal, I believe. And on, is that right? Yes. And then the, uh, there is a solar telescope on Elta 80 in the middle, which is amongst those telescopes that actually received the signal. So this is a current set of observatories that we're using. Uh, again, you see different shapes. This down here on the, in the lower right, this is actually a field that's laid out with diodes to measure uh, radiation coming from the sky. Um, these observatories become very, very big. Uh, let me give you an example here. This is an observatory that uh, we are using. Uh, it has, uh, you see on the lower left, four uh, telescope domes. Each of those domes has an eight-meter telescope inside. An eight-meter, eight-meter I mean is the, pri is the size of the primary mirror. Okay, so it's eight meters in diameter. It's over 50 square meters surface. As a student once said to me, this is bigger than my apartment. Okay, so, so we now have telescopes that are the size of a one room apartment, admittedly, but uh, nevertheless. Um, so you see on the left, we have four of those. We have in addition to those smaller movable telescopes of 1.8 meter uh, size. And then on the right, you see uh, the Milky Way, the Milky Way going across, you see two, uh, the two close uh, neighboring galaxies to ours, the, Bo the Magellanic Clouds in the south, and you see that this telescope is actually shooting a laser into the sky. Uh, what we do is we, we use this laser to create an artificial star in the sky to help us observe because we have to deal with the atmosphere. Um, I wanted to show you here something that uh, often gets forgotten. Uh, we, we look at the sky with our own eyes, with, the, with uh, what we see in, in what's called the optical. We're now building, together with uh, the Americans and, and East Asia, we're building a, a telescope which is composed of 66 individual antennas. And we can actually move these antennas so that we can refocus, if you want, the telescope. And um, it's, it's operating in a place in, uh, where we can't really see it with our own eyes. It's in, in the millimeter and submillimeter range. And let me just demonstrate to you what this does. What you see here is a picture in the optical. This is a picture in the blue light, and you see the stars. Now, each of these stars has temperatures of a few thousand degrees Celsius. Okay? So that, that's the surface. Our sun has 5,000 degrees Celsius on the surface. Yes. So, so you see this dark cloud in there. That dark cloud is 
dust that's blocking the light from coming from behind, uh, blocking the lights of the stars behind this cloud. So we can't see those stars. Now, if you take that same observation in the infrared, this is now radiation that we can feel as, as heat, okay? If you take that observation, you already see that you see more stars. Some of the stars come through. Now, if you would be able to observe this in the millimeters, in the mil at millimeter wavelengths, okay, it's going to look like that. Now, that cold dust that you couldn't see before is glowing because you can now see the cold universe, which we, we can't see with our own optical eyes. Okay? It's all the stars have disappeared. They're too hot to be visible, but the cold gas, the cold dust is visible now. Now, just to give you an example here, um, this is how I look like in, ra in, in infrared radiation. Okay? And you look at the glasses. The glasses are much, much colder, which I never realized. They're much colder than my face. Okay? So that's what we're doing with those new telescopes. Um, this is how we build it. we're building this. This is being uh, constructed right now. We're going to be finished next year. Uh, you need these transport transporters. Each antenna is 120 tons. You have to pick it up. You have to put it down to a, one, to a millimeter accuracy uh, at 5,000 meters altitude. But you see at the bottom how they are built. This is done in Chile. Now, the next step, I have three more slides. The next step is the next giants. Okay, We want to build... Uh, telescopes that are bigger than what we have right now. And so we want to build uh, these, on the left side you see a, a, a picture, a, a dream if you want, of a telescope that has 40 meters in diameters. Okay, 40 meters from one edge of the mirror to the other ed edge of the mirror. This is about twice the size of this room, just to think about this. Okay, now you pick this up and you point it every every place in the sky. So that's the daunting task that we're looking at. We need this to look at these planets that are being discovered by these various satellites. Uh, on the right, you see two other models. This is uh, two American uh, projects. One is called the 30-meter telescope, so that will be a 30-meter diameter telescope. And the other one is called the Giant Magellan Telescope, which is a slightly less, uh, uh, slightly smaller, but also a big thing. Just to uh, come back to my one room apartment, the 50 square meters, this thing, the 40 meter telescope, you can build your house on that mirror if we would let you, but we will not. So this is the inside. Uh, I'm gonna skip this mostly. Uh, we have essentially received from our countries in ESO the, the go ahead. So we, we're, we have the project is ready. What we can do now is we can actually start building it. So it's provisionally approved. Here is another example of one of the giants of the future. This is called the Square Kilometer Array. This is a radio telescope. That telescope will have, as the name says, it will have a, surf, a collecting area of one square kilometer. Okay? That's the idea, to have thousands of antennas spread around. As a matter of fact, this should cover half of Africa. Okay? Uh, because you need that big size to, to see uh, very accurate in the sky. And then to come back to the last one, um, this is now a, a trial, actually it's working, but it's not working at this scale, to see cosmic rays. Okay? What happens is when a cosmic ray hits the, uh, the, the, the top of the atmosphere, it creates what's called Cherenkov radiation. It, it creates secondary radiation, which you can observe with big telescopes, big optical telescopes. And that's happening right now. Uh, I've mentioned the, the neutrinos down there. The neutrino telescopes are working. They need to become bigger, and they be need to become more sensitive so that we actually can then explore all the phases in this universe that we see. So I'll finish with this one. It turns out ESO, the organization I work for, is turning 50 years this year, so we're celebrating with uh, our very large telescope. And so hopefully this is gonna last for a bit. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bruno. Uh, well, these large telescopes are aiming at finding the Big Bang and how we all started and searching for other civilizations. But we have also other issues that we don't know, and one of them is when we look inside us, 
and try to find, instead of the largest scales, the smallest scales inside us, including how our body works and how we can find new methods of fighting disease. And that's the topic of our next speaker, uh, Professor Batsheva Kerem. She's the scientific director of the National Center of uh, Genomic Res uh, Technology here at the Institute of Life Science at the Hebrew University. She is a member of the scientific team that discovered and that characterized the CFTR gene and former president of the Israeli Society for Genetic Development and Committee. Uh, she received many awards, among uh, them the Abish Frankel uh, Prize for Excellence in Life Science and the Met Prize for Contribution to Genetic Research. So, Bucheva, please. Hello, everybody. <clears throat> I feel uncomfortable among those smart people from physics. I'm from biology, from genetics, and I would like to show you what we are trying to do in order to understand the language of God, if I can say, the language of the DNA. If I can have the... This. Okay, sorry. So, the language of life, as you may all know, we are talking about the DNA, the double strand DNA, the double helix, discovered 60 years ago. We are celebrating at this time of the year the 60 birthday of discovering the DNA. And importantly, the DNA is telling us a story using a language, like any other language, which is built on letters, in this case only four letters, that makes words of three letters, each word only. And the words generate a sentence, which is the gene. So the four letters are, as you may know, T, A, C, and G. And the sentence built by letters and words is the gene. A gene for eye color is a piece of DNA with an encoded information to generate green eyes, for example. And the blue eyes is the same information in another individual with a different letters, maybe only one letter that m might be different and another eye color will be encoded. So here is the DNA, the genes, and they are packed into the cell as chromosomes. So I think that this is all what we need to know in order to understand what I'm aiming for. Several years ago, several companies, biotech company, companies, including one in Israel, generated a way that we can stain each strand of DNA with another color. You may know that we get 23 such strands from our father and 23 from our mother, so we have 23 pairs, and we can stain each of them by another color and look at them under the microscope, a regular microscope, not with a very, very sophisticated technology. And what I'm, I will concentrate is on what happens in cancer, one of the major problems in human health. And I'll show you that cancer is a problem of the genetic code. So what kind of problems, as I hinted already, can be found in the DNA? So as can be seen, we might have substitution of even one letter from A to G, then we'll have another information, or no, no information, what we call nonsense. <clears throat> we might have an insertion of uh, extra letters, deletion of letters, etc. So one hallmark of cancer is changes in the DNA. They might be with the result of breaks in the DNA, so the information is disconnected or reconnected 
in a bad way, in a perturbed way, and it can be due to all these changes that I just have shown you. So through life, in one of the cells, there is a change that starts the cancer process and leads to many more changes in the genome. So my lab, I will quickly um, show you some, I think, exciting results uh, from my research group that was already published a few months ago. And then I'll show you what I see is the revolution and maybe what we can expect from such a research. So in my lab, we asked what is the basis for this breakage and instability and changes in the DNA, and we wanted to look at the very, very early stages. And we decided to look, this is the student who did the work, at cervical cancer, which is a very common cancer in women, as you know, and as we all know, it is caused by a virus, human papilloma virus. We chose this system since, in contrast to other cancers, cancers in this case, we know the starting point when cancer is started by the infection with the virus, and we know within the virus who are the genes that start this process, okay? So, using a very, very nice technology invented in Paris by a scientist called Aaron Ben Simon that was in Israel for a few years, but now he is in Paris. He invented, together with his brother, who is a physicist, now I can connect to you maybe, uh, David Ben Simon, a way that you can stretch the DNA on a surface, on a small surface, and actually each strand you see on your left, stained in green, is a strand of DNA. And we can look, I will not go into the details, on the right we can follow how the DNA is replicated and how cells are pro propagated, but I won't go into this. And what I want to tell is that we have noticed that once we express the genes, the cancer genes that are encoded in human papilloma virus, what we generate is cells start to proliferate, Cancer is a disease that cells start to proliferate. From one cell we get two, from two we get four, etc. However, there is not enough building blocks of DNA. There is not enough biosynthesis of A, G, C, and T in the cells. This was a big surprise for everyone, including us that discovered it because it's counterintuitive. We thought that once cells are starting to proliferate because of the cancer uh, instructions, then the DNA will robustly be replicated. But we found is that something is wrong and there, are, there is not enough synthesis of A, G, C, and T. And because of that, we get all these changes, all these breaks that lead to to cancer. What we were able to do in the lab oops, is to correct it in a model in the lab, in the tissue culture. We infected cells with the virus or with the genes of the virus and supplemented the cells with extra building blocks of the DNA, A, G, C, and T. And all of a sudden, the cell continue to proliferate, but no breaks, no changes, and they lost their tumorogenic potential. So it's a simple answer to a very complicated question. We don't have enough building blocks of DNA. So just to summarize, you can see in the upper panel, I hope you can see in the upper panel, a scheme of a normal proliferation, a normal signal for a cell to proliferate. Usually, this signal comes from outside the cell by a growth factor, which normally is regulating all the processes required for normal proliferation. However, if a cancer gene is starting the program, this Cancer gene does not take care of many, many processes, including the synthesis of the building blocks. And that's one of the very early problems 
we have in cancer. So, about almost ten, uh, eight years ago, <coughs> the genome, the genome project, the human genome project that you may have heard about, was finished. There was a big project, a an international project led by labs in the states, in Europe, and in Japan, that aimed to read the entire content of the DNA of an individual. And it was one individual. You may know it was Watson from Watson and Creek, those that discovered the, the, the DNA, the double helix. So the DNA of Watson was actually read. So we know from chromosome one, letter number one, to chromosome 22 and the X and the Y, we know what is written there, the order of the letters. This, the cost of it was three times 10 to the nine dollars. There was no technology, no computer power at that time when the project uh, started and all this was invented. And now we have a much, much progressed technology and we can read the genome of all of us now for the cost of $5,000 and in two years it will be only $1,000. And in connection to cancer research, what I would like to show you at the last part of my talk is that now we can actually read the entire language or the, the entire DNA in a cancer cell. Okay? Okay. So there is a new project which is called the Cancer Genome Atlas, which is aiming to read the DNA content in many cancers. And without going into too many details, there are already two very important study published in Nature <coughs> just last year, showing that we can actually look at different patients, at cancer cells from different patients that are morphologically and by pathologists are defined as the same disease. By looking at the DNA, we can subdivide them into different diseases, and very importantly, we can divide them by the changes in the gene and predict who is going to respond to a specific therapy and who is not going to respond, and maybe even be uh, affected badly, negatively, by an anti-cancer regime. So I think for the future, we will be able, it's something that I can see, I can vision with some hope, okay, that we will be able to get a signature of specific cancers and based signature of the changes in the DNA that are typical for different cancers and based on this, develop drugs that will be specific for a specific signature. So I will end by this. Thank you, Batsheva. Uh, our last speaker is Professor uh, Tommaso Poggio, uh, Eugene uh, McDormand Professor at the Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences at uh, MIT and a uh, co-director of the Center of uh, Biological and Computational Learning. And uh, again, there is a whole list of prizes that he won and I will try to shorten it a bit. He is the recipient of the Otto Hahn Medill Award of the Max Planck Society, the Max Planck Research Award, the Gaber Award, the Okawa, Okawa Prize, and so on, so on, so on. So uh, uh, his research work is basically uh, studying the brain in order to build new robots. And the idea of learning from us how to go to uh, build robots, and these robots will solve maybe the problem that Jeff posted at the beginning, how to combine robots with humans in a way that they will work together. So please.
Thank you. So, um, as you heard, um, um, robotics will help, is already helping, space exploration. Um, and I will speak how another kind of exploration, exploration of our brain, will help to develop, in addition to understanding ourselves, will help to develop in more intelligent machines and more intelligent robots. But before that, since I'm the last speaker in the panel, I would like to connect um, uh, our, our session back to the main obvious message of this afternoon, which is um, simply that uh, basic research Curiosity-driven basic research is quite important. Uh, many non-scientists may think that um, basic research th th you heard about, um, even if done with scientific tools, is a bit like rock climbing or ski skiing, uh, which is you know, a, a very human activity, but economically, uh, from the point of view of economists, not very relevant. Now, I disagree, and I'll tell you a little story about this. 11 years ago, actually, uh, let's see, 13 years ago, I went to Pavia, uh, to a un one of these old university cities in Italy, almost as old as uh, Bologna and the Sorbonne, to get a laurea honoris causa. And the, uh, the event was because it was the bicentennial of the invention of the Pila, the battery, by Alessandro Volta who published the paper in the Proceedings of the Royal Society in 1800. Now, you have to imagine um, you know, the time. There was a museum that just opened then uh, to describe how the times of Volta were and the impact of the invention on the society at that time. Um, you know, it was, it, the discovery was really an exercise in curiosity-driven research, mainly motivated by the fact that Galvani, a competitor, a neuroscientist, an anatomist in Padua uh, claimed uh, something about animal electricity. And, uh, and Volta, as a consequence, invented the pillar to prove that Gal Galvani was wrong. Um, and, uh, um, you know, the invention allowed for the first time in history to produce electricity for times longer than a microsecond a spark. So, in fact, the original pillar provide, I think, 2.1 volts, I have a copy at home, for about 2.5 minutes or so, okay? And then, after that, uh, it was possible for scientists to study electricity. And, um, you know, 1800, uh, this was uh, Napoleon, in fact, Volta was made Count, Count Volta by Napoleon for his invention, and until then, the speed of information in the world traveled really at the speed of a horse. In 1450, when Constantinople fell to the Turks, this was the year more or less that Columbus was born in Genoa, from Genoa. Um, at the time, the news of the fall of Constantinople reached Vienna uh, three weeks after the fact. Paris, four weeks. Madrid, five weeks. And so the speed of information remained the same and until Volta uh, was the uh, horse um, traveling 24 hours a day. And uh, after Volta, 10 years, 20 years later, there were telegraph lines, and then there was uh, Hertz, Maxwell and Hertz, and uh, you know, radio and so on. In a few decades, everything happened, including chemistry and electrical generators and so on. So this is probably. Um, you know, one of the first examples, I would assume the first example, that even professors can have an impact on real life. <laughs> as a professor in, in Padilla. So, um, the, mes the message of the panel is, of course, that many of, all of our progress as a society come from our technologies, and many of them, um, in, I think indirectly, most of them, come from basic research. And my specific message right now is that an important 
And this century, an important part of basic research will be in neuroscience. And, um, and before I start mentioning real neuroscience, I have to say what it means to understand, to understand um, something like the brain. Um, but let me first say that I think understanding the brain and uh, uh, the product of the brain, which is the mind, is the intelligence, is a core question for all sciences. And the reason I'm biased personally I, uh, is the following. Is, um, when I was a kid, I was fascinated by, by the theory of relativity, by the fact that Einstein, with uh, the Duncan experiments, just thought was able to predict something like E equal mc squared. Um, so the question well, is, uh, um, you know, what was in the brain of Einstein that made him different from, from all of us? Um, and how would it be possible to add circuits to our brain and make ourselves more intelligent? make ourselves able to solve problems like relativity. And there are many of them, not just relativity or um, you know, teleportation. So these are the, the problems that fascinated me, understanding the brain. And um, this is, by the way, Einstein. And on the right is uh, an old friend of mine who died, Francis Crick was mentioned before. On the left is David Marr, one of the founder, also a close friend, also died, um, founder of Computation Neuroscience, which I'll describe in a second. Before doing that, um, I have to explain what it means to understand a system as complex as the brain. You know, what does it mean to understand an iPhone, like this one? Um, well, it, it means something different to different people. If you are a, a user or a software engineer, you want to understand the software of it, how it works in terms of commands to do speak or to send messages and so on. If you are an electrical engineer, you may want to understand how the transistors and the chips inside it work. If you are a computer scientist, like I am in part, you want to understand the algorithm for speech recognition, for instance, that, that Siri is using on the iPhone. And of course, the, the brain is not a computer, but it is a computational machine. And, uh, and so um, we can understand the brain at different levels. We have to understand the brain at different levels. You have to understand it not only from the point of view of the genes in the neurons of the brain and the level of the connection between neurons, and the general architecture of the brain, but also understand the algorithms and the strategies and the computation that the brain is doing in order to make us think and to make us perceive the world. And so this is what computational neuroscience is um, occupying, with, trying to understand how the brain produces the mind. And um, 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 uh, and if you want to understand the brain, you have to deal with uh, quite a bit of complexity. You have here neurons, which are cells, which have uh, 10,000 connections with uh, other cells, um, many more than, by the way, the transistors of the gates in system like this, which have um, typically like three or four connections. Um, so, I want to give um, a short example of work in computational neuroscience from my own work. It has to do with uh, visual cortex and visual, part of visual cortex called the ventral stream, um, which is uh, uh, um, a further about of the cortex in uh, our brain. Uh, yep, I have some um, bad behavior of the slides, but uh, you can see here the 
parts of the cortex, a wiring diagram of different areas from primary visual cortex back up. And uh, there are in, in our visual cortex about one billion neurons or so. Actually, this is uh, probably from one to 10 billion neurons. And uh, um, we are beginning to understand some of the algorithms or the strategies that a visual cortex is using. Um, and in fact, over the last 10 years or so, we have been able to, in my group, to uh, have a models that can um, replicate uh, many properties of neurons in these visual areas. Uh, this V1, by the way, is in the back of the head, and information goes for, come from to there, from the eye, and from there to the front of our brain, where more decision-dedicated uh, areas are located. And uh, um, this model can reproduce the recognition ability of humans under certain conditions for certain type of images. Um, but that, that has been quite interesting and uh, very useful to physiologists. But there was something quite intriguing that happened recently about it. And this, this is that we had a model that we could simulate on a computer um, completely. But we could not quite understand how it worked. It worked pretty well, better than, uh, for recognition, better than visual system built by engineers. But we couldn't really have, apart from a summon intuition, a good understanding of properties of it. Uh, it may be a general problem in, that we'll find in modeling the brain, that we'll have models that will work, but we don't, will not have a deep understanding of how to improve them or why they work as they do, under which conditions and so on. In this particular case, we have developed over the last 12 months a theory that it actually seems to explain quite a lot of why the model worked and maybe how visual cortex works. And um, the theory is very much in the spirit of physics. It starts from a, an assumption that the goal of the ventral stream is to learn during development. In the case of humans, when humans are baby, babies, and to learn how images of objects transform because of translation and scaling and rotation, and from that being variant to those transformation. Um, so that's the assumption that this is the computational goal of um, the ventral stream, or one of the computational goals. And then from this assumption, we are able to prove theorems um, that um, predict properties of neurons in visual cortex and also architecture. Here, for instance, is the prediction of how neurons in visual cortex should develop by being exposed to vision. And, uh, um, Below, you see that similar uh, receptive fields, similar tuning of the neurons, are found in actual experiments in which physiologists record from single neurons with uh, microelectrodes. Now, I, I, I don't have to, time to go into this, but uh, it's almost uh, too nice to be true, and it may well not be true. It's certainly quite exciting because it would be incredible if it, we could have in neuroscience a theory with, uh, or theories with the elegance and the power of physics theory, starting essentially from symmetry properties, conservation properties, invariance properties to transformation, and ending up with describing fine details of properties of the neurons. Um, but let me finish with this, just to mention that um, I think that we are in a golden age for neuroscience and for artificial intelligence. Um, there have been uh, recent successes in artificial intelligence, uh, especially because of machine learning, a field which I've been working, how to um, learn from experience, how to make algorithms and computers learn from experience. And um, successes that come from this are things we, you probably know, they uh, range from uh, 
machines that can, can beat us at playing chess, like Deep Blue, to machines that can beat humans at Jeopardy, a question and answering TV game in America. This was Watson and IBM computers. To systems that are better than humans in finding articles or books like uh, Google search, um, uh, and, and so on. There are now systems, uh, there is a company here in Israel, Mobileye, producing a system that can will drive a car better than human drivers uh, based on vision, uh, and so on and so forth. So we have machines that are able, that are as good as, our, as we are, as intelligent as we are, in narrow domains of intelligence. We still don't have machines that are as intelligent or humanly intelligent, as intelligent as we are. And for achieving this goal, I think we'll need a combination of neuroscience and computer science. And this is what we have recently started at, at MIT um, under um, a, a name that we call the Intelligence Initiative, trying a multidisciplinary effort, trying to put together uh, neuroscientists, computer scientists, physicists, mathematicians, in trying to, uh, again, 50 years after artificial intelligence, to make progress on this problem of what is intelligence and how to replicate intelligence in uh, machines. Thank you. Uh, I guess we have time for one or two questions, so uh, if somebody from the audience has a question, we could try to answer them. Yes. Okay. Uh, I have a question to, to uh, the astronomer. Uh, what was the, the size and the distance of the planet you showed with a covered star. <laughs> so that's, um, the planet itself is, is about five times the mass of Jupiter, okay? The distance is very small, it's only five astronomical units, so it's only five times as far as the Earth is from the Sun, from the star. Another question over there? Uh, well, yeah, go ahead. Can you speak louder? Yeah, please. Whether you can re replicate sentience, you know, the subjective aspect of uh, you know, our, our mind, I guess you could say. Uh, do you see those two things as, as one and the same? Do you think we'll ever uh, replicate uh, sentience? Uh, and if so, should we? Yeah, that's, um, of course, <laughs> an important question. Uh, um, I can ask uh, a question back to you. How do we know whether we'll be able to replicate? <laughs> you know, th this is... Uh, this is the essence of the Turing test. I think the, it's not a very satisfactory definition of intelligence, but in a sense is um, what has served as a definition of intelligence for the field of artificial intelligence. The Turing test is this kind of imitation game proposed by Alan Turing in 52 or so. It's, uh, I think, the 100th anniversary next week of the birth of Alan Turing. Um, and the imitation game is you put something in a room, uh, connect to it a teletype at a time, and you as a person has to decide by, after a discussion of a few minutes with the computer, this is what Turing suggested, whether in the room there is a computer or a person. So a number of system, computer systems have managed to pass this test in narrow domains. You know, it's easy for a computer to fake being a psychotherapist. <laughs> I think it's easy to fake being a financial advisor and so on, um, an economist. 
Um, but, you know, I think uh, some of the jobs that we think are probably most easy for us, like uh, being a gardener or a butler or a cook, I think are still unreachable by a computer or a robot. And I think in general, being able to imitate all aspects of human intelligence is something I, I don't know how, not even in terms of a project for the future, how, how it could be done. That's the challenge that requires basic research and certainly more than a few decades of it. Um, I have a question for Bracheva. Um, to connect the uh, no, no neuroscience and uh, genetics, what, um, what do you think is the connection between, like, considering that um, the human intelligence and is included into the, the genome? So, uh, uh, without offense for tomato, but uh, maybe the secret of human intelligence would reside in. Uh, in uh, decoding the, the DNA, so what, what's your, uh, what's your hint in that? Thank you for suggesting it, yes. From my point of view, I do think that most of the, what we are talking about is encoded in the genes, although it's very dramatically affected by the environment. So it's an interaction between genes and the environment. And we have many discussions in our institute between neuroscientists and geneticists trying to convince the neuroscientists that they should look for genetic basis of some of the uh, features that they are looking into it. And I think that this will be part of the future. Thank you. Um. Uh, thank you. This is one. This question is directed for uh, Jeffrey. Um, with the shutting down of the NASA space program, do you think that there will still be a lot? Um, I mean, it's obviously a very sad thing, but do you think that the amount of private space flights will um, make not kind of make up for it? And just what are your thoughts on the NASA space program being? No, let me being? just clear it up. The NAS NASA has not shut down its space program. It's unfortunate, I think, that when the shuttle stopped flying, the way the media treated it led a lot of people to believe that NASA was stopping space flight, period. Uh, NASA no longer has a rocket to launch people into space and we are getting rides on a Russian rocket. It's not the first time that the U.S. has not had a way to put people into space. After the Apollo program uh, was ended, it was, uh, that was in the 70s, and it wasn't until 1981 that the shuttle stopped flying. Um, we still have the International Space Station. We still have people going up into space. But um, basically, Getting people into orbit around the Earth is no longer cutting-edge technology. We've been doing it now for 50 years. We know how to do it. Um, and by the way, NASA never built its own rockets. They were always built by private industry on contract to NASA. And that's the only difference. Look at what's happening now is a change in the way we're contracting the services. The idea is that if private industry will provide the services, NASA will buy those flights into low Earth orbit. I think the big economic question is whether there will turn out to be enough other customers besides NASA to make this a viable economic activity. And that's still something that won't be answered in, until a few years from now. NASA is building a new large rocket on the scale of the old Saturn V, because what NASA would like to concentrate on is not the, what we hope will become relatively routine trips back and forth to low Earth orbit, but to once again renew the quest of exploring the solar system and going beyond the Earth, back to the moon, visits to asteroids, someday to Mars. That's what true exploration is really about, and that's really what I'd like to see NASA be devoting uh, it's human spaceflight resources to not just getting people into low Earth orbit. Well, 
One more question. <laughs> One more difficult question, I'm afraid. <laughs> I'm interested in um, if anybody on your panel can identify what is the definition of life and when does a machine fall into the category of being alive? I can't, I, I cannot say, I cannot answer your question, but I answer another question. So I keep, which is related to yours. I have been discussing many times with my colleagues about whether computers will ever be, you know, uh, able to do what we humans do. And I have invented a criterion. The criterion is we will know that the computer does what we do when after some interaction with the computer, the computer says, I need a break, let's have a cup of coffee. 